Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the study of the book of Acts, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning with chapter 23, verse 1. If you have not seen the previous studies on Acts, I really hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, all the previous videos are uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. All right, so let's begin now with uh, chapter 23, verse 1 in the KJV. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Oh. Well, I, I give you just a little bit of um, context here. Um, assuming that maybe you haven't been watching this from the beginning of Acts and your current, but uh, Paul now is under arrest from the Roman official. He was in the, uh, the temple, the Jewish temple, and uh, caused a big riot. Um, they, the, the Jewish authorities wanted to kill him, and... Um, the Roman officials rescued him, put him under arrest, and they were going to beat him to get try to find out what uh, testimony from him to find out what happened. Uh, but he told them he was a Roman citizen, so they backed off and realized they better treat him uh, according to Roman law. And but Paul asked if he could speak to the the, the uh, Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish uh, religious leaders there. Uh, before he was taken away, so this is his opportunity to give them uh, a, a message, and he starts off uh, saying, "Men and brethren." Now, this is a mistake that uh, there's a there's a brother here on YouTube that uh, uh, recently he he said that uh, he thinks that uh, in Acts chapter 15, verses one, two, three, four, it it, it uh, the um, Jewish people from uh, Jerusalem are uh, confronting Paul and telling Paul that uh, you're teaching men that they can be saved without following Judaism, but you're wrong. You cannot be saved unless you're circumcised. And, uh, they, and so that caused a disagreement between me and the, the brother. It's, uh, he, he, he was thinking and he was promoting the idea that a person can believe uh, in Jesus uh, and, and think that uh, to be saved they've still got to be circumcised or water baptized or any other number of other things and they can still be saved. Uh, and, I, and I said no, they, they can't be saved unless their faith is entirely in Jesus. They cannot believe that uh, believing in Jesus and circumcision is required because if you think there's any other requirements besides faith in Jesus then you've nullified the grace of God as Paul said uh, it's either all grace or all works it can't be a mixture of the two uh, uh, otherwise grace is no more grace as, as Paul says so uh, Paul is uh, but the brother's argument is that, well, he refers to them as brethren. And, uh, well, brethren doesn't, uh, you should not assume that when the word brethren is being used by Paul, that these peoples are saved believers in Jesus. Uh, the word brethren is used for a Jewish person speaking to any other Jews. So that's the context in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. He, you should not assume that these people are saved. They're teaching a false gospel that faith in Jesus and circumcision are required. So just because Paul calls them brethren 
don't assume that it's brethren in the sense that they are saved Christians. They are their brethren in the sense that they are fellow Jews. And this is the same point right here. He's talking to the Sanhedrin. To, he's talking to the council. These people are not believers in Jesus, and yet Paul calls them brethren. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, uh, I have lived in an all good conscience before God until this day. And high priest Ananias, Ananias is not a saved Christian, he commanded them that stood by, uh, by him to smite him on the mouth. This kind of reminds me of Caiaphas, and the trial of Jesus, and uh, how they were they also hit Jesus in the mouth when he was before the council uh, because they didn't like his answer. And But Paul confronts them and says, you're challenging me on not following the law, but you're not following the law right now. It's not lawful that you, uh, you hit me in the, in the mouth the way you just did. Let me read these uh, first couple of verses in the Amplified. The reason I like to look at the Amplified after the KJV is the Amplified translation or version is a combination of a translation and a commentary. So sometimes you get little, you get it amplifies it so there's more information and uh, so sometimes it's helpful. Um, chapter 23 verse 1 in the Amplified then Paul looking intently at the council the Sanhedrin the Jewish high court said kinsmen um, see, this is another good example here that, that kind of verifies what I just said. Kinsmen, uh, because these people are kinsmen in the sense that they are uh, from the same family line of uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David. They're, they're, they're from that uh, line, and therefore, therefore they're kinsmen. They're not, as it says in the KJV, brethren that, that uh, someone could think that, oh, they're brothers, they're believers. So it says, kinsmen, I have lived my life before God with a perfectly good conscience um, until this very day. At this, the high priest, Ananias, ordered those who stood beside him to strike Paul on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. It sounds a lot like Jesus, too, when he called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. Um, do you actually sit to judge me according to the law? And yet, in violation of the law, order me to be struck? Um, there was a couple of footnotes here, A and B. Let me see what the footnotes say. Um, and the first footnote is Acts 23, verse 2. Ananias served as high priest from A.D. 47 to 59. He was a violent man who had close ties to Rome and was assassinated by his own people about 66 A.D. The second footnote is on verse 3. Paul probably referring to the outside wall of a tomb, which was considered ritually unclean and polluted. Tombs were usually whitewashed on the outside so that passers-by could see them more clearly and avoid contact with them. All right, so that's an interesting historical note. Uh, since it mentioned the time frame for Ananias, maybe it will be helpful for those of you who haven't watched this from the beginning. I've constantly referred through the book of Acts, uh, referring to the historical timeline of all these events. Uh, and uh, it, it probably is a, should be a big surprise to, to most of you. I know I was surprised as I uh, began to understand the, the time frames of all these events in Acts. And the book of Acts is basically uh, a historical record of the church the first 30 years, starting off at Pentecost, and then uh, after, Pente let's say Pente Pentecost is the beginning of the timeline, uh, the beginning of the church, and then say three and a half years after Pentecost you had Stephen martyred uh, and then two and a half years after that you have uh, Saul of Tarsus become the Apostle Paul, Paul's conversion and then uh, four years after that 
you have uh, the conversion uh, of Cornelius and his family. Uh, the, the first apostle to the Gentiles was Peter being sent to preach to Cornelius and his family. And, uh, and, and then uh, um, now you have, uh, that's 10 years after Pentecost, 10 years before it, there were any Gentile believers. Uh, and then you have about 10 years after that, you have Paul's first missionary journey. And then in the last two chapters, we've had Paul's first, second, and third missionary journey, the accounts of that. And now that's all completed, and Paul now decides to go back to Jerusalem, even though a prophet told him that he would be arrested there. Uh, he, Paul says he was compelled to go, compelled by the Holy Spirit. And sure enough, now he's arrested. Um, so um, it's, I find it very, very interesting. I hope you do too, that um, we think of the book of Acts probably as uh, most people think, oh, this is happening in a very condensed period of time over the period of months or just a few years, but it's decades. It's over like a 30 year time frame, the whole book. So let's get it back now to uh, the next verse in the KJV. Verse 4, And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now, it says, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. And does that mean Paul did not know that he was the high priest? Let's see how it says it in the Amplified. Verse 5, Paul said, I was not aware, brothers, that he was high priest. Okay, so I find that interesting because I believe this is the same Ananias, even though it's 20 years later. The trial of Jesus, you had Caiaphas. I believe Ananias was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And, uh, and, of course, Paul was being a protege and a student of Gamaliel, the most uh, learned teacher in, uh, in Judaism at the time. And so Paul was, should have been very current of, of all these officials. Perhaps this is another Ananias, I don't know, but I find it surprising that Paul does not know. Or maybe he knows Ananias is the high priest, but he doesn't know that this particular person is Ananias. Um, verse uh, Six, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, uh, now the, 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 this, these groups of the Sanhedrin uh, were divided over the, the issue of resurrection. The Pharisees believed in a future bodily resurrection uh, of, of, I'm assuming, mankind. Not, I don't think it was just the Jewish people, but just all of mankind. It, just as I believe, just as the Bible teaches, someday there will be a resurrection of all the people who've ever lived, a bodily resurrection. Um, I think that's coming in the fairly near near uh, future now. Uh, and at the resurrection, it, the, it says the resurrection of the just, those people who are justified, who are saved, who are going to go to heaven, uh, they're justified because of their faith in Jesus as their Savior. And also, it says there's a resurrection. Uh, I believe this is a simultaneous resurrection of the unjust, those people who are not justified, who never put their faith in Jesus. And therefore, their only hope is that they could go before God and say that I'm perfect, I've never sinned. And of course, they, they can, can never win that argument because everybody sinned. That's the very reason Jesus even had to come into this world, be born, and die for our sins, is because it was impossible for any person to live a life that was perfect and then go into judgment and say, see, I deserve heaven because I was perfect. God, knowing that man could not do that, he offered this remedy. He says, I'll become a man. I'll live a perfect life. I'll give mankind credit for my perfect life. Uh, and, and, and for all their sins, I'll take the penalty for their sins. Uh, and so 
that's what happens when we put our faith in Jesus. We get his righteousness imputed to us, credited to us. God looks at us as a perfect, holy, righteous person who's never sinned because Jesus' righteousness is covering us as a, like a white robe. Uh, and and our, our sins are not on us. We're not marred or no, no blots on us. That was all put on Jesus at the cross. And the scripture says on the cross, the sins of the whole world charged against, were charged against him. And, and he became sin for us. It wasn't that he actually became sin and that he was sin. It's just that there's so much sin of the history of all mankind, past, present, future. Everyone's ever lived. All their sins were put on Jesus. Imagine, it looked, it looked like he was sin because all the sins were put on him. So um, that's the difference in the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in a future bodily resurrection the Sadducees did not believe there was a bodily resurrection. And, uh, and Paul uses this point where a disagreement between these two factions to uh, cleverly uh, create a situation where he could uh, use it to his advantage. So it says, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out, cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and uh, of the hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. And when he said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. So Paul, very smart, uh, he uses this issue to his advantage. Verse 8, For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisee confess both. Hmm. Neither angel nor spirit. Let me see verse 8, how it phrases that. For the Sadducees say that there is no such thing as a resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees speak out freely and acknowledge their belief in all in in them all. Hmm. So I'm not sure what it means here uh, when it says the Pharisees don't believe in uh, a resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit. Um, I'm not sure if he's talking about they don't believe in angelic beings, uh, or if he's talking about man's spirit being in the, like, like uh, some people refer to man's spirit as his angel. We are not angels, uh, like like the angel uh, uh, Gabriel. Uh, no, we're not like like that. But we we are angels. And I am an angel, in the sense of the definition being a, a messenger. I'm a messenger right now. I'm giving you the message that salvation is a free gift offered to you right now. Uh, if you put your faith in Jesus, you receive the gift of salvation and eternal life. That's the message, and I'm the messenger, so the word angel means messenger. And evangelist has the word angel in it, and Eve means good, so an evangelist is someone who, who has, who's delivering a good message, the good news. Um, so uh, the Sadducees apparently don't believe in the, any of these things. The Pharisees do. Verse 9, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees uh, part arose and strove saying we find no evil in this man <laughs> so, because Paul is on the side of the Pharisees uh, in the question of the resurrection oh now they like they like Paul um, um, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him let us not fight against God <laughs> hmm so they're, now they're wondering, okay, maybe there's some truth behind what Paul, Paul is doing and saying. Maybe God has instructed him, so let's not fight against God. If he, if it, this reminds me of what Gamaliel told the, the Sanhedrin uh, many years earlier uh, when Peter and uh, John were arrested and preaching and, and uh, they were deciding what to do with them. And, and uh, Gamaliel said, well, if they're, 
if what they're saying is not from God, then it'll it'll just fizzle out, as so many of these people in the past, uh, many people came and said said that they were the Messiah, and it just all fizzled out. Um, but if if their message is true, then it's God's behind it, and you can't stop God. So. Uh, he's, Galileo said, just leave them alone and, and see what becomes of it. And that kind of reminds me of what they're saying here. It says, let us not fight against God. It's the same kind of thing that Peter said also to James and uh, the, the elders in Jerusalem after he preached to, to Cornelius and his family, Gentiles. And James and the, the J J Jerusalem church, they were outraged. How could you even enter a Gentile's house? And uh, uh, Paul gave his account, I mean Peter gave his account of the whole thing. You know, he got the vision, God told him to do it, and, and then they got, these Gentiles got saved in the same way, they, they the same way as them, by believing on the Lord Jesus. That's the exact words that, that Peter used many years before Paul is using that same term, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, Paul says in Acts 16, 31, but way back in Acts, uh, you know, um, I'd say Acts, uh, uh, you know, how would that happen? Well, say 10 years after Pentecost, I don't remember what chapter it was, but many years earlier, Peter preached to the Gentiles, Cornelius, and he said, he, he told them, believe on the Lord Jesus, and they did, and they were saved just as us. So it was the same message of believe on Jesus, and Gentiles got believed, and they spoke in tongue. That was the sign at that time. That was the evidence that, hey, they'd been uh, uh, the Holy Spirit that was now in them. And so Peter at that time said, don't blame me for talking to the Gentiles. I was instructed by God. I'm not going to argue against God. It's the same kind of thing that these people are saying now. He said, um, if an, a spirit or an angel had spoken to him, that's Paul, let us not fight against God. Verse 10, and when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, this is the Roman uh, authority, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the following, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Okay, this is really an interesting verse here uh, because the way it's phrased, I could very easily take it exactly literally that Jesus appeared to him bodily again at this time. It says, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said. So this was not just really the Lord speaking to Paul. Paul, Paul got some kind of a, uh, clear, clear audio, uh, you know, message. He heard God speaking of Jesus speaking to him. Uh, it wasn't a vision where he just saw him, but no, he actually was there, standing by Paul, and said, "Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome." Okay. I think that's a good place to stop for today. Um, um, all right, so I'll pick up with the next verse, uh, verse 12, next time, chapter 22, verse 12. Uh, for now, uh, again, I just want to remind you, if you came across this video today and you're not aware that I've, I started with Acts chapter 1, verse 1, I hope you will go look at that the entire playlist and do follow this study completely from the beginning. The study of the book of Acts is really one of the most important uh, that you'll ever come across because 
it, it gives us the uh, the ch history of the early church, and it, it and it clearly shows us that in the beginning the church was in error in two important things. One, that uh, Jesus came only for the Jews. We learn in Acts that no, uh, Jesus came for the whole world, and the Gentiles now are believers. Uh, Jewish believers didn't want to accept that in the beginning because there was a uh, extreme hatred from the Jews towards the Gentiles. They wouldn't associate with them. And then the other error that needed to be corrected was that the Jewish believers thought that uh, well, what they're supposed to do is practice Judaism and believe in Jesus. And then uh, we learned that with Peter going to Cornelius and his family, God reveals to him that the dietary laws don't apply anymore. That's the first thing in Judaism we see that is, is, is uh, removed. Uh, and then later on we find out that circumcision is, 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 is not required. And then all of the Mosaic laws, and then uh, uh, temple worship, animal sacrifices, but that's, that's uh, established in, in, um, uh, in Galatians and especially in, in Hebrews. So the first mistake that needed to be corrected was that uh, uh, Christianity was for the whole world, not just for Israel and the Jews. And that uh, in Judaism, this religious practice uh, was not only was it not required, but it must be discarded because you cannot divide your, your faith between Jesus and practicing religion. All right, thank you for watching. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.